certainly happy to see all of you this, this evening. That reading in Genesis 14 is always, uh, it puzzled me for a number of years, and then I think maybe I came to grasp perhaps the significance of it. You know, a lot of times the Bible doesn't say this is the reason this is written. But, you know, those three promises that God made Abraham uh, came with a lot of tests of his faith. And I believe uh, just as in 13, 12, they had to go out of the land of Egypt down to, I'm, I'm sorry, out of the land of Canaan down into Egypt because there was a famine. And I think, you know, if I'd been Abraham, God, I thought this was going to be our land and it'd be good. Chapter 13, uh, Abraham's lot, uh, herdsman, Lot's herdsman, there's a, what happened between them? There was what? There was some strife. And he said, well, there's no need for this. We, we're brethren. And uh, so family problems. And then in 14, land problems. Ketelamer and his kings come over. They, if you think about a map, you know, here's, the, here's the, the land of Canaan, Saudi Arabian desert, and the Euphrates, the Tigris rivers. And they come over from, Ketelamer comes over from Mesopotamia. They come over the Fertile Crescent, several hundred miles come down. Which reminded me, I know we're not studying Genesis, but years ago I read um, in Baker's Bible Atlas that that area was very well known for copper mining uh, other kind of ore. And so, you know, they served Ketelamer 14 years. In the 15th year, they rebelled. Likely, they were coming over there and, and you know, taking, uh, taking deposits from that. And whatever the case was, they took that, those five cities of the plain and Lot was down there. And then Lot goes, he took him up, and then Abraham raises that small army, goes all the way to Dan, and comes back, it just indicates again another test of Abraham's faith relative to the land promise. But he's victorious, and uh, I, I just, I just, I love reading this so much because used to I'd, I'd read all those names, you know, and think, well, what's the purpose of all that? And I think that is the purpose to show that all these things were going on, and yet God was faithful to His promises. Comment, question, anything? It goes to show our shortcomings when we think, well, that can't be right. Yeah, exactly. God knows it's right. God knows it's right, exactly. And then on the way back, by the way, we didn't get to that. A reading next Wednesday will be there. He meets this mysterious character in Salem <coughs> by the name of Melchizedek. And <laughs> of all the things, Mo, I, I have made, you, you may think I'm beating a dead horse, but of all the points that Moses could have made in the life of Abraham, and in a hundred years, you know, it's, it's compacted. There are several chapters, 12 to 25. But still, you've got two verses that, end, that show in 14. Uh, Abraham meets Melchizedek, who was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. Abraham paid a tithe. Melchizedek blessed him. And guess what? <laughs> Five, six, and seven of Hebrews are dead, devoted all to that. And it's just, you think, what's the, what's the big deal? <laughs> Well, Christ is a priest and king after the order of Melchizedek, right? Okay. All right. In our readings tonight, we had we had several books. Uh, several. Uh, we had Obadiah through Zephaniah. Uh, several things, but most of them were very short. Uh, uh, Obadiah is actually a judge. Uh, shows that God was going to to judge whom. Edom, yes. And it's interesting, even in the latter part of Obadiah, verse 17, but in Mount Zion there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Not in a physical way, but they would be all together in what? In, in what was that? What did you say, Patty? Spiritual. Spiritual relation, yes, in the church, the Messianic age. Real briefly, Jonah was sent to Nineveh to preach to those people and he did he wanted to go as soon as God told him, true or false. He wanted to go but not he, he wanted to go a different direction. Uh, and, and God wanted him to go to Nineveh, which from where he was there on the coastline, Nineveh would have been uh, up north uh, eastward, and he went all the way to Tarshish, which is over towards Spain. He went the very opposite direction. <clears throat> and so uh God prepared this fish, swallowed him. They're already in the back, I think. If 
Yeah, they're in the back if uh, Miss uh, Miss Robin here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, God prepared the fish. The fish swallowed them. And then it changed uh, Jonah's attitudes <laughs> considerably. So in chapter 3, he goes to Nineveh, preaches. And then in chapter 4, uh, he, he's actually complaining because what did they do? They actually repented. And uh, God makes a point of that. But Jonah is significant to the New Testament because Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days. And Jesus makes that a tremendous point in Matthew 12, and we'll see it tonight, possibly, in Luke 11, that uh, uh, Jonah became, or the Ninevites became in their own generation, it would rise up in judgment against the, judge, the generation in which Jesus lived because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Uh, Micah, <coughs> it, we have in Micah uh, a time element mentioned in the first verse. During the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, concerning Samaria, and that's the northern kingdom, and Jerusalem. Around 735 to 700 is the, the uh, time period which would, would go through the uh, capture of what kingdom? 735 to 700, the northern kingdom, 722 B.C., you remember. And so chapter 1 deals with the fact that uh, Israel's destruction is is uh, declared, and they were. Some of the sins are mentioned. Uh, verse nine: For her wounds are incurable. Come even to Judah, reach to the gate. Not only, and that reminds us of Jeremiah three. You would have thought Judah would have learned the lessons from what was going on in Israel. They were a little bit behind, but you know, not they really didn't. In chapter two: uh, The uh, judgment was inevitable. And in chapter 3, uh, rulers, priests, prophets are denounced in the American Standard heading, which is good. But then in chapter 4, uh, latter days are coming, the Messianic kingdom. And then in chapter 5, verse 2, we have a prophecy of whom, or, or what, rather? Jesus. Jesus' birth and the specific Bethlehem. place, the city, Bethlehem Ephrathah. So there were several Bethlehems but uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah in Judah. All right, and then in uh, 6, we have um, uh, the, the injustices are rebuked. In, in verse 8, is there's almost a parallel of, of, Judah, uh, Judah, of Micah 6, verse 8, to Matthew 22. Um, the Lord has showed thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly. What does your translation say? Be fair. Do justice. Justice. To love kindness and to walk humbly with thy God. Uh, and Jesus talked about that, um, didn't he? In Matthew 22, in verse, uh, Matthew 23, rather, verse 25. Uh, won't take time for that. But uh, moral corruption is... is uh, <clears throat> Denounced in chapter latter part of six and seven, and then in seven, uh, there is again uh, there would be a time. It's almost like when you look at the minor prophets in my Bible here. You look at the last paragraph or two, and it's going to be a, a picture of the messianic age, and that's what we have here. Nahum, uh, God's goodness is indicated, but His his judgment is seen in that uh, some city is going to be overthrown. Nineveh, right. It's, the overthrow is, is described as utter ruin. Habakkuk, uh, what do we have here? It's during the, about 612 to 606, uh, Judah is going to have their comeuppance, but he actually <coughs> identifies the oppressive nation. Who is it in verse 5? Uh, six, I'm sorry. The Babylon, or the Chaldeans, that was the tribal name of them. Uh, and verse 5, if you haven't ever marked that, I would. Behold ye among the nations, and look, and wonder marvelously, for I'm working a work in your days, and you will not believe, though it be told you. You wouldn't even, you, you don't know what I'm doing, and how I'm doing it. But God was raising up the Chaldeans, it all, you know, natural means, but He was using their designs to punish his own people. 
And, and yet there would be some people who were of faith who would be righteous, continue to be righteous. And you notice down in chapter 2 um, and uh, verse 4, Behold, his soul is puffed up, it's not upright in him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Paul uses that a number of times in the New Testament. And the, the, the righteous shall live by faith. And these people who are living by faith would, would be separated. In other words, the judgment would come. And yet, in a sense, the ones who were living righteously by faith would, would be um, spared from the persecution they were receiving from their own brethren. Have you ever seen members of the church? Here's somebody in the church that's trying to do right and make it to all the services and somebody else is a member of the church but they don't care. And they actually poke fun of those who are trying to do right. Have y'all heard? I, I, I've heard, I've, I've been witness to that. And, and, um, and I take that to be really what Habakkuk is dealing with in some of this. Uh, then in uh, Zephaniah, we're time, time's sake, uh, the, the, the time element is again 6.30 to about 6.25. We have the, during the days of Hezekiah and Josiah uh, the, uh, in verse 1. And the picture is what? God's going to do what? Destroy. What's that, Patty? There will be a day of punishment. There will be a day of punishment. The, and, it, and it's interesting that in Zephaniah, the, the phrase day of the Lord is emphasized throughout. It's not the last day for us. But it was a day of judgment for them. All right. Uh, but God didn't leave all of just, I'm going to punish Judah, but I'm going to leave everybody else alone. He's fair in his judgment. And just as he judged Judah for their sin, he judged the other nations, and some of them are mentioned in these passages. All right. Comment, question, anybody? All right. Let's go to the life of Jesus. We're all over the Bible, aren't we? Genesis. Minor Prophets, Luke 11. We're, we're there now, Luke 11. And <clears throat> we are in the what ministry? Closing ministry, that's right. And I wanted to, I think I had this, I know I had this chart ready last Sunday, but I, I don't believe I showed it to you. Uh, this is, I, I've kind of adapted this from a, New King James study Bible that I have, and I thought it was pretty good. The unnoticed whom Luke notices. Um, we've emphasized that Luke, emphas Luke emphasizes what aspect of Jesus' care, uh, uh, being? His, not his deity, but his, his humanity. And there's more said about Mary, more said about women in Luke. Uh, the, in fact, the genealogy in Luke 3 goes not all the way back to Abraham, but all the way back to Adam. And the last verse says, who was the Son of God. Uh, and so it shows that Jesus is kind of a brother to the human race. And uh, Elizabeth, Mary, Anna, the widow of Nain, uh, the sinner who anointed Jesus' feet, uh, certain lady disciples who are mentioned in 8, the woman searching for a lost coin in the parable of the uh, ten coins in chapter 15, <clears throat> Persistent widow petitioning the unjust judge, sorrowful women along the way to the cross. It, 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 it was, as you know, there were ladies who discovered the tomb first. And then uh, some who were, uh, would be considered social outcasts, Gentiles, shepherds, and some of them at least, Samaritans, tax collectors, sinners, lepers. And uh, again, Luke's emphasis seems to be Jesus' humanity, especially shown in the early chapters. Physically, Jesus is home to be a, a brother to the whole human race. All right, and then where we are, our years of preparation, 30, beginning ministry with the baptism, his baptism. Then he goes up into Galilee for about two years, and then he retires from the crowds because people are primarily following him for, for, the, for, the, for food, sea signs, wrong reasons. And so primarily in Luke, we've got about four or five chapters in John, but primarily about 10 in Luke deals with this area. And the time element is about six months. And here's where we've been. John 7, 8, 9, and 10, Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Jesus' uh, speech in 8, heals a blind man. He continues with uh, the fallout from that in chapter 10. 
And then he sends the 70. They returned and said, oh, wow. Even the, even the spirits are subject to us. And then we have after that the parable of the Samaritan. And he visited Mary and Martha. So now we're, we're, Jesus encourages the disciples to, to pray. So we, uh, Oh, and by the way, this is pretty much a, an outline of the, the 11th chapter. Uh, teaching on prayer. G, uh, that's the first 13 verses with the model prayer plus the parable uh, of the uh, troubled host, the persistent or importune friend, and he makes a point on that. And then, uh, then the blasphemous accusations against Jesus, he, he performs a miracle, and then we have a lot of his, his uh, speech that is very similar to what we've already read in the Galilean ministry in, in Matthew. And then, while eating with the Pharisee, he condemns them and stirs up the wrath. Six woes are pronounced, three to Pharisees and three to the lawyers. Okay, so he encourages disciples to pray. Let's, let's look at our text and, uh, and go after it here. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, teaching in these passages. Not that others is, <laughs> you know, you say, but somebody says, this is my favorite passage. Well, what about all the other passages? They're not your favorite. Uh, all right, let's read the first five, first four verses. Randy, if you would read that for us. Luke 11, 1 through 4. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, O Father, which art in heaven, I will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Give us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, thank you, Randy. Uh, I'd like if you got the uh, Waldron material handy, if you go to page 93, 93, uh, Jesus encourages his disciples to pray down here on the left hand column of the left page, page 93. Um, just glancing at what the Waldron said here, the examples of Jesus many prayers had a powerful impact on his disciples. Once when he had finished praying, they said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples, which is what Brother Randy just read. And you'll notice in the colored text box right underneath there, kind of a beige color, it's interesting to consider this request. Did the disciples not know how to pray? Had they not heard prayers in the synagogues? Yes, but they did not know how to pray personally to God as Jesus prayed. That is what they wanted to learn. How do you pray to the Father? Uh, we have a, a, a similar prayer called, a lot of people call it the Lord's Prayer. It's actually a model prayer, pray after this manner, that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. So it's obvious that Jesus had, had taught before, perhaps some of these disciples who were with him at this point had not heard that. But nonetheless, he... Uh, he, he, he gives pretty much the, the same in, in substance of what he has taught earlier. Um, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Uh, you, you can read a lot on, on that. that you know, the, Fer and the Waldrons mentioned this, that you know, the Pharisees had set prayers that they would almost like a catechism. And um, how's that little prayer that people parents sometimes, uh, maybe not Christians, true Christians, teach their children now I lay me down to sleep I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I die before I wake I pray the Lord my soul to take y'all remember that? in a rhyme, and, and just to memorize something like that, um, uh, I, that to me that's pretty weak, that's pretty shallow um, and, I, and I'm not talking about necessarily prayer at, at large but it looks like to me when we teach our children, teach our grandchildren to try to pray, uh, they, they can hear us first. And then, and, and, and 
we always tried to emphasize, and I'm no, we're certainly no example maybe, but I, we, we felt like this was right. Don't make it long for you little people. Make it short. Their attention spans are short. And, and just get the idea of being reverent to God and, and pray to God and let them know that God hears you and God wants you to, He wants you to talk with them. And He wants us to talk with Him. And there's a desire that, that I believe is all through the Scripture that God, God wants us to address Him. Uh, so there's a personal part of that that we want to be, and there's certainly a difference between personal prayers and public prayers when we're trying to incorporate uh, maybe the needs of, a, of an assembly. Um, but it, it looks like, teach us to pray, when the disciples said that, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And, and then he, he begins, when you pray, say, um, Father, hallowed be thy name. I've got a uh, something up here that I wanted to let me see if I find it real, real quick right here very similar uh, there is a little bit of an abbreviation in this prayer from what's given in Matthew 6 some of the translations if you read Randy you use the King James don't you the King James translation has probably the most exhaustive form of it a lot of your translations will have marginal readings that indicate uh, exactly what uh, Randy was saying or some manuscripts omit that but still it's, it's a little bit more for instance at the end for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory that's not even in the, new, in the King James but it's basically the same in, in, in substance as Matthew 6 uh, he, he encourages the disciples to pray, here we go this is, Pat, this is the chart I wanted we have three requests for others and three requests for ourselves and he starts out by addressing God, Our Father who art in heaven, or our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, you know, in the Old Testament it was Jehovah, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now it's simply our Father. Um, he, Galatians 4, about verse 5 and 6, uh, For this cause he sent the Spirit of his Son in our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba was the uh, Aramaic term for what we would say daddy. Daddy. And there is that closeness that we need to feel. And at the same time, and here's where we have to have a fine line. We want to feel close to God as if He is a, a friend. And yet He's the creator of the universe. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. Hallowed comes from hagiazo, uh, which is used only 29 times in the New Testament, and it, it's to me it means to render venerable, to separate from profane things. Now, when you read things like that from Thayer or Strong's or some of the other older uh, lexicons, and you see, and you use, you hear the word profane. That does not mean profanity like we mean profanity. Uh, Always, uh, It doesn't mean that, but it is in contrast to the sacred. Which, and so you've got the sacred versus the common. And that's the point he makes there. Don't, don't look at God's name as common. Used to, I read a lot more than I do now. People would say, you cannot find that either in sacred or profane history. And you know what they meant? Sacred history would be what? The scripture. Profane history would not be it's using vulgarities all through. It would just be secular history. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the difference. Profane and, I mean, a, a sacred and profane. And that's kind of the use here. That hallowed, hallowed means to separate. He's to be kept holy. In fact, it's used, um, it's only used one other time translated hallowed, and that's in the, the model prayer in Matthew 6. For 26 times it's used the word sanctify, sanctifieth, sanctified in the verb form. And then it's used one time in whole, uh, the word holy is used to, to uh, translate it in Revelation 21, uh, 22 verse 11. So, hallowed be thy name. Idea is in the name, it means the whole being, that we are to revere God, honor God, keep Him separate. 
And obviously that means in our speech we're not to use His name in, in vain. Obviously. Hallowed be His name. Uh, the psalm, psalm we sometimes refer to, Psalm 111, I think it's verse 9, um, holy and reverend is His name in all the earth. And so respect, respectful in, in our addressing of God, but, but at the same time while He is to be hallowed, He's still considered our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Universal reverence for and worship of God is what I believe is the idea behind that. Thy kingdom come. Of course, Jesus has been talking about the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The church. The, the messianic age. And that people would obey the gospel and the kingdom would spread and God's rule among people is accepted. The, the idea of kingdom we've, we've emphasized is is God's rule, God's authority among people. And thy will be done uh, as, on, as in heaven, so on earth. That God's will, always, which is always carried out in heaven, might be carried out in our lives on earth. So three requests for others, that people would honor the name of God and worship God, that His kingdom would come and spread, and, 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 and that His will would be carried out in people's lives. And then request for ourselves. Give us this day our daily bread. He didn't say bread enough for a year, but just what? Just enough for today. Yeah. It's, isn't it interesting in the prayers of Jesus and the prayers of the apostles, even in the Old Testament, do they ever ask for all kinds of things, luxuries and all that? No, it's just what, what we need. What we need. Um, physical necessities and uh, the recognition of our necessities and dependence on God for these. And uh, forgive us our debts. I'm saying we got physical necessities, spiritual necessities, forgive us our debts or our sins while we forgive those who've sinned against us, forgiveness of our past, and bring us not or lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, concern in the future for our remaining one with God and not being carried off or apostatized. And so that's the idea. Sometimes people will look at this, lead us not into, well, does God actually lead us to be tempted? James 1 says, God tempts no man. Um, it's, you li please lead us in a way where we can be, whenever we are tempted, because we all are, that we can get away from it and we will be delivered. So I think that's the sense of that idea. Comment, question, anybody? I just wonder if it is. Why they ask at this point in time? Yeah. Is it because Jesus is praying more? He's getting closer to the end. They're thinking, you know, we need to learn what he's doing. I, I would think so. Yeah, because he's been chastised yeah. several times about their little faith they've got. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I would believe that would be right. There was something about the prayers of Jesus that... Um, when I was younger and I would listen to uh, men pray, uh, you know, it was almost like when some people, some men pray, older men that I had a lot of respect for, it was almost like you felt like you were right there before the throne of God. You, there was just a reverence, uh, almost word pictures that would paint, be painted to describe and, and, and I don't think it was for eloquence sake, but it was just, it, you could tell they prayed. I've told people, uh, especially young men who, in training classes, that are bashful, shy, they're very self-conscious, that one thing I believe that can help public praying is just do a whole lot of private praying. So you're so used to it, that, that it almost comes more naturally. It grows out of, of uh, your relation with God. Um, older I get, the more I guess I think about this too, that, you know, we won't, while God is to be revered, at the same time, I think we can breathe a prayer to God when we're driving. If we talk on our cell phone, we can talk to God. Um, if we... Uh, uh, talking to ourselves, we, we, can, we can breathe prayers wherever we are. And, and I believe that helps us. If I could be personal, it helps me. It uh, helped me to get through this next little thing that I've got today. 
or if I'm going to be around some rambunctious people, uh, help me to keep from losing my cool. <laughs> you know, just just help uh, and and you don't know, you never know providentially how God works that things will work out in answer to to, to these prayers. But that's the general prayer. Any, I've been doing most talking. Somebody, Angela, you look like you want anybody. No, don't pray at all. No. No, you just do the best you can. You do the best you can. God does listen. Yeah. He does hear, even if I cannot express it. Like yeah. That. Plus, we have an advocate yes. to help us when we pray, not knowing um, exactly sometimes how to say or what to say. If you're holding God in reverence, yes. hallowing His name. I, don't, I do not mean being disrespectful. Right. Yeah. God I think that's right. Heart. That's what God is. Yes. There's a, there's a passage that I believe uh, bears on this. In, in Romans 8, 26 and 27, Paul said, In like manner the Spirit also helps our infirmity, for we know not how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And He that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I, I have taught for a long time that the Holy Spirit is in the in the field of communication. He communicates God's will to man through the Word. He verified it with miracles. And it looks like from that passage that God communicates our desires to the Father. If it doesn't teach that, I know it doesn't do an injustice to other passages. But um, but nonetheless, that, that we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit... Um, make it intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered that that he knows the longings of our heart and he sends that to the Father. One last thing, Philip. The way God communicates to us is through the scriptures. Right. And the way we communicate to God is through the Holy Spirit. Right. Through prayer. And so when we pray, we don't pray in the language of man, but we pray in the language of the Spirit. Either way. Yes. You're exactly right. You're, you're exactly right, Patty. Uh, on our little uh, schedule, you, you may remember this. I had, um, uh, I made the point, uh, let's see, it's a long sentence. Whether one reads three or four chapters in one sitting per day is shown in the schedule or adopts some other plan. Bible reading is paramount for the reasons given above. Prayer is our communication with God. Bible reading is God's communication with us. And the only way to know his will. Every day should include both. Uh, I, I, I just can't emphasize it. And I, I made the point, Lee and, Lee and I both, especially with people that we, we love and, and it seems like they're tottering on going away from the Lord. And just ask them the question, um, have you been reading your Bible and have you been praying? And when people are really honest with us, you know what the answer is. Neither. They have done neither. And that, that communication that you mentioned, Patty, is exactly right. You cut off God speaking to you through His Word, and you're making known to God your wishes. You're just, it's, just, it's like thanks, but no thanks. You know, when our kids ask a lot of questions about things, you know, how would you, and Rob said, have you prayed about it? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the only way to answer those mm -hmm. prayers. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. All um, right. Let's see. All right, let's 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 move on. On the, uh, the next paragraph, uh, we probably might not finish it, but let's read on. Uh, David, if you would, 5 through 13, uh, Luke 11, 5 through 13. And it, this is, again, the, he's just given the instructions relative to prayer. And now he's going to give encouragement to be persistent. 
or importune is the older word. Okay. And he said, which of you should have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to say for him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread, or any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All right. Uh, the, the, the point of emphasis in, in a word is what in this parable? Persistence. Persistence, yeah. Um, so it's easy to lay off and, and uh, well maybe since I didn't feel like I got an answer from God or the, the, the circumstances have not turned any differently then I'll just stop um, so he said the, the illustration is here in the verses 5 through uh, 8 that's really the, the parable here's a friend and he is um, at midnight he comes to a friend's house and he evidently the door is still closed and uh, maybe he's knocking you know hey I'm, I've got a friend who's coming to me and I don't have anything to feed him I need three loaves and the answer is verse 7 get, get lost <laughs> don't, don't, don't you're bothering me it's, have you looked at your watch <laughs> your sundial have you looked at trouble me not? The door is shut. My children are with me in bed, evidently around one room house there. I cannot rise and give thee. Well, he could because he did, but he couldn't without disturbing the whole house. It's a bad, bad time to ask. And I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because of his friend, because of his importunity, your translation probably says per persistence. Uh, he will arise and give him as many as he needs. Now let's stop there and don't, don't look, that, that's where the parable ends. Um, one word on the, um, or an idea on the word importunity, it, it's only used here and one other time in the New Testament. It's used, um, uh, I'm sorry, it's only used here in the New Testament. And it comes from a Greek word that um, actually persistence is close but it's mostly uh, shameless boldness. Shamelessly bold to just be annoying about it is the idea. Um, and, and really the older word that we have, importune or importunity, is a little closer. <coughs> and since a lot of people don't know what that word means, I think the word persistence has been, uh, has been used in some of the newer translations. So, because of this friend who comes at midnight is just persistently, uh, you know, begging, hey, I need three loaves, I, I don't have anything. Okay, reluctantly. He gets up, disturbs the children, and he finds, and he gives him really whatever he wants. Now, Jesus makes the application, and then he uses another illustration even within the application. I say... And then we've got the same thing we got in Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. And then the illustration is between a good father and his son. All right, the son says, Dad, I am really hungry. Could you give me a, a little loaf? And he says, well, there's no good father that son asking that's going to turn around and give him a what? A stone. It looks like a loaf. And basically to, um, uh, jot it down a couple, basically to deceive him, he's not going to do that. 
Or it's a, dead, a piece of fish, a little meat would taste really good, and he's not going to hurt him, give him something harmful, by turning around and giving him a serpent. And then Luke uh, adds one other th thing, or he asks for an egg and he gives him a scorpion. Uh, some of your commentators will say that, that when a scorpion is kind of rolled together, it looks like an egg. And so, you, you know, whether it be deceit or trying to hurt. And so he says, no father on earth who has any kind of goodness at all in him will do those things to his son. And then he comes back to the relation we have to the father. So he says in verse 13, if you then, being evil, that is in comparison to whom? To God. Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So, the, the, the point is that here is, uh, here's the mock, the, the pray. You, you need to pray like this. And then I want to tell you why you need to keep praying. And then he gives the, the parable of this persistent friend who comes at midnight. You just need to remember to keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And God is going to give us what? It's what is in our best interest. Yeah. Um, Lee and I were talking about this last night and, and yesterday and some of this today also. That um, uh, God is, God is in, in, in uh, contrast to this fellow who's the friend who is very reluctant to give uh, three loaves to his friend who comes at midnight. But is God reluctant to help us out? No. So there, there is that contrast between now he, okay, if you really, and the point of emphasis is be persistent. But there's, but all of the parallels don't don't parallel. They they, they fall. Um, and Lee and I, it bothers us about sometimes things that we hear. Um, we are we are to pray for each other. Paul wrote the Colossians that they would pray for him that uh, uh, he might be bold to speak the gospel as he ought to speak it. Colossians four. But sometimes we hear. Um, and I hear this word prayer warriors sometimes. And people, it's almost like we've got to get everybody praying for this or else we're God. It's almost the unspoken word. God probably won't answer our prayers unless we have. And it's almost, Bob Walter used the phrase, like some people think you've got to, to storm the gates of heaven uh, in order for God to answer you. And if it's just a few people, God won't answer. We're not discouraging a lot of people praying. But it's interesting that in James 5th chapter, James uses Elijah. And he says Elijah was a man of like passions. He didn't say Elijah was a prophet and therefore God answered his prayer because he was a prophet. He was a man of like passions as we and he prayed that it not rain for three years and it didn't. Pray that it rained and it did. Then he goes on to make the application. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, singular, avails much. So I, I think we should never get the idea that if we if we, we just got to round up everybody to pray for this particular need, or else God is not going to answer. And I'm not discouraging. This is a fine line, I think. But I just want us never to get the idea about God that He is very reluctant to grant us something that would be in our best interest. That's not the God we serve. <clears throat> and, and it's almost like people have put God in the place of this, this uh, man who was uh, being bothered at midnight. Well, I guess, I guess I'll just have to. That's not God. There's the contrast. Of God to the the uh, man, should we all pray? Yes, yes, but but never get the idea that, that God is reluctant unless we've got the whole brotherhood praying for some something. Does that make sense? I just think it's a fine line, but I think we need to respect that and not get the idea 
if there's something in my life that I need to pray about and I've not talked to anybody else, um, I think God hears me just like He hears anybody. <coughs> if He hears 10,000 people, if there's one person versus 10,000. Do you want to say something, Brother Gene? It looked like I saw a hand up. Well, I was just coughing, but you know, I'm thinking David, he uh, had a lot of adventures and spent a lot of time in prayer. Yes, by himself. And Jesus did as well. And Jesus did as well. He, Jesus. And that does not nullify uh, other. But I never want to... I, we just need to appreciate that God is interested in each one of us. He's interested in your individual, your private prayers, and, and the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so I want us to just keep all that in mind. And, and he, I mean, we are his children as individuals. Yes. We are all his children. Yes. But in To, yes. each, each, soul does each soul matters. That's exactly right, Patty. That's exactly right. Okay, uh, it's seven till. I tell you what, let's do. Let's stop, and we'll, Lord willing, Sunday morning we'll answer our questions and go on with uh, Luke eleven. The Lord wills, and and uh, we'll we'll do that. Any last comments, David? Looked like you had an idea on your mind you wanted to share. I was, just, I was just thinking, you know, that's the thing that she was talking about, you know, what about our personal own prayer, our own personal prayer? Yeah. So we kind of defeat our own purpose after our own personal prayer. If we had to think everybody had to pray for something in particular. Yes. Yeah. It would be useless, you know, if we, if we did that in our own life. I believe that's right. I believe that's right. And God is not about Yes, that's right. <coughs>